Aloha. Good morning. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's time for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicella, your host. Today's title is Make USSR Great Again, Invade Ukraine. You know, it was November 9th, 1989. What title the- is that, Tim? <laughs> Invade Ukraine. <laughs> you heard it here on Think Tech. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, you know, Jay, <laughs> that's kind of where we're at in this story. So that's why, uh, you know, we're going to talk about Vladimir Putin and his motivations. Mm, and, okay. uh, you know, in 1989, Jay, as you well know, in Winston, uh, the, Berlin well, the Berlin Wall fell. And then a couple of years later, on December 25th, 1991, the hammer and sickle flag of the USSR came down on, off the Kremlin um, flag post. And ever since then, um, you know, we, Russia allegedly was going to reform into a democratic nation and join the free society and the free economic world. Uh, Boris Yeltsin, with the combination of uh, Valentin Yushmar, um, decided that a, a young man by the name of Vladimir Putin would be a great replacement. And back then, Vladimir Putin, believe this or not, was perceived as democratic, liberal, and well in favor of market reforms. Uh, what happened in between 1999, when he was appointed prime minister, and today is uh, left to uh, one's imagination. But here we are. Uh, And here we are now with Vladimir Putin, who has ordered 100 plus thousand troops on three points of the border of Ukraine, poised what it seems to be an invasion. And uh, that's where we're at. We we have the potential of Ukraine being invaded by Russia. And uh, Joe Biden, President Biden, has attempted to um, discuss this matter with uh, Vladimir Putin at Putin's request. And the question goes to you, Jay, is... What is Vladimir Putin up to? What is his agenda? I'm taking Ukraine, in a word. And it seems obvious. It's like Xi Jinping wants to have Taiwan for you know many geopolitical is, reasons. Let me interrupt. Uh, is this a matter of uh, national sovereignty issues to make Russia great again and have satellite states? Maybe. Maybe he wants to return to the good old days of the USSR. I mean, it's, that seems, if you connect the dots, that's where you go. Um, you know, he did that uh, in, in the south, the south of Russia, and he's, he's doing it here in, in the west of Russia. So um, it's just a matter of getting there. Uh, what, what I find interesting is these conversations between Putin and Biden. Um, and Biden makes these, uh, what do you call it, veiled threats. Uh, of sanctions. Uh, and he says they're really draconian sanctions, but we don't know what they are. And uh, I'm not sure that that puts by, uh, uh, Putin off the track at all. Um, he's just playing. And at the end of the day, you know, no matter what Biden does, Putin knows that Biden not going to be able to get Congress behind him. Um, so he's, he's going to do what he's going to do. And I agree with you. The big question is, uh, what is he going to do? And um, what, what, for what purpose? And I think the answer is to expand his influence uh, over uh, Ukraine, which could be a buffer state uh, or could be part of NATO. But if he, if he holds Ukraine, controls Ukraine, um, he's out of the woods on that. And he looks good to the Russian people and to yeah. the world. He looks powerful. You know, Putin is an ex-KGB spy. Um, he actually kind of excelled in communications and propaganda. That was his forte. And Certainly, he's been able to pass that on down the line to certain leaders here in our country. Um, but the bottom line is, Putin says uh, he wants legally binding agreements between NATO and Russia that weapons will not be sent to the Ukraine and or and to any neighboring country. And certainly, doesn't want Ukraine to join NATO. He's compared this situation to the days of uh, you know the October crisis, missile crisis of 1962 when uh, Cuba had missiles and, um, you know, President Kennedy said vehemently, those missiles have to go. And he's comparing the two uh, as exact same situations that how would the United States like it if, if Cuba had missile, uh, nuclear missiles back again? Is that a fair comparison on Putin's part? No, how would Western Europe like it if, if Putin puts uh, nuclear weapons in Ukraine? You know, it's the same thing in reverse, which he will do. 
Um, I mean, he's trying to get them to, to stand down on everything. Don't include them in NATO. Don't give them weapons. And there's probably other parts of that deal, too, that that for geopolitical reasons, for, you know, Putin's, um, you know, aggressive moves on Ukraine, it, it obviously, I mean, it gets him in the same direction, maybe the same place as if he if he took it over. You know, I mean, Putin is a KGB guy. You, you know, you can always get there indirectly what you couldn't do directly. So how do you how do you achieve the, the, the territorialization of Ukraine without actually firing a shot? I think that's what we may have here. So he has he has the soldiers on the border. Uh, he makes threats. He uses hacking to knock off the utilities. He's done that a few times. Um, he's got, you know, he's got people who are working for him inside of Ukraine. Um, he is trying to intimidate them in every which way. And he's trying to intimidate Western Europe. Don't forget the pipeline. You know, he's, he serves up gas to Western Europe, especially Germany. And uh, they, they never really resolved that, I think. So, so I, think, I think you're right um, that uh, Putin is going to use this, quote, agreement. And Biden thinks everybody, everything can be resolved by an agreement, even if it doesn't favor your party. Um, so this agreement uh, is, is very crafty on the part of Putin. And I think he, he is going to use it, he is using it as, as a way to control the situation without ever firing a shot. All right. Uh, Winston, I'm going to bring up a question uh, from one of, a member of our audience, and we certainly appreciate all the questions we get. And it kind of goes along track to what we were just talking about. And the question is, what are the comparisons drawable between Taiwan the People's Republic of China and Ukraine and Russia, where America attempt to establish a substantial military presence in Taiwan, it would most certainly lead to war, hence our light touch. Is that the same reason we haven't integrated Ukraine into NATO? I think they're, they're reasonably uh, yeah, similar comparisons. And you have to think about it, you know, we're thinking about it from our point of view, which makes sense. Uh, from defending, uh, you know, a, a freer, a freer world, uh, but, but historically, you know, th these these nations consider this their area of influence. So when the Soviet Union fell apart, now this was, you, we have to think about this this um, conglomeration of nations. A lot of the, had nothing to do with with each other except impose, imposing this uh, horrendous uh, political uh, political ideology of communism on people, which was. You know, uh, disastrous uh then they, it fell apart and you can imagine though that there's a lot of people in russia that uh pine for those days when they held that suzerainty over uh, the entire uh, entirety of uh then what became the commonwealth of independent states later but they, they saw their power evaporate then they have a savior in a man like putin who i think is still a pretty well regarded inside of the Soviet Union, whether it's propaganda or not, he is the strong man that, uh, that seems to be, um, you know, desirable in that, not just that country, but increasingly around the world, we're seeing the strong manism uh, really make a resurgence. As far as what's actually going to happen, it's uh, like the Wall Street Journal says uh, today that he's going to do what he perceives as in Russia's best interest. So that will continue with the bullying, the threats, the, uh, uh, you know, incursions, whether it's uh, I don't think it, it will be military this time. Actually, I think it, he'll send in his uh, special forces and destabilizing things and the, the cyber attacks and all the all the things that we're used to. But I think that the uh, the he's pushed it pretty close and he realizes that uh you know anthony blinken's been pretty clear that whatever we did or did not do more importantly in 2000 uh was it 14 when when he took over the uh the crimea um that there could be some very serious consequences this time around economically that said he also supplies uh you know western europe with with Hour, and all he has to do is shut off the taps. So there's there's a lot of geopolitical interests here that are not going to be solved in a day. And it's not just political. It's it is uh, economic. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know corporate. A lot of things here. At the end of the day, he is a bully. He's going to continue to bully his neighbors. I just saw in my newsfeed that uh, 
uh, Slovakia signed a, a defense agreement with NATO, allowing uh, troops to be used to be, I don't know, stationed, transited their, their airports. I'm not sure what it is. It's, it's, uh, it, and so that's right on the border of Ukraine. It's, it came precipitously um, this week, right before and during these negotiations in Brussels and, and Geneva and, and wherever else are going to happen. My sense is that they're going to back down. They'll find a pretense. They'll pull back. Russia has a lot of problems on its own, but this is a way where he can huff and puff, make himself look good, turn around, say we've achieved our objectives and go back. Okay. You know, Jay, the more things change, the more sometimes they, they, they appear to remain the same. And I'm reminded back in the, you know, the history lessons of uh, post-World War II when Churchill and Roosevelt met with Stalin in Potsdam, and they basically carved up Eastern Europe, specifically Poland got the shaft. Uh, they basically traded away their sovereign rights. Um, where has been Ukraine in all these discussions? Uh, or has Ukraine under the wire been, um, you know, are they, are they at the table as this conflict's being unfolded? You know, it's a huge mistake um, to, to exclude somebody that should be included. You know? I mean, they are a stakeholder, uh, don't you think? Absolutely. This, you know, this is what happened in, um, in Afghanistan, too. Uh, you know, we, we didn't negotiate with all the parties at the table, or well, Trump didn't back when. As I recall, Afghanistan wasn't included in the discussions, everybody else, but not Afghanistan. <laughs> and so here you have, um, you know, Ukraine not included. And there's no good reason for that. Um, I, I, it does uh, indicate that we don't treat them as very important. We don't treat their government as very important. It's a mistake. And uh, who's to say that um, that Biden and Blinken are doing the right thing? They've been criticized pretty roundly on a number of points. I mean, they, they did mess up, I'm sorry to say, the Afghanistan withdrawal. Um, but I think they might be in retrospect, you know, history will judge, but might be messing up what's going on in um, Eastern Europe. Um, so <clears throat> I think, um, you know, it's, it's a very good comparison to see this as, as uh, the way Hitler mm, dismembered Europe by his bullying and threats and his special deals and what have you in the late 30s, um, you know, and, and of course, Chamberlain and, and, and you know, appeasement and all that. Um, and we are probably on a, on a path to do that, do some kind of appeasement and let them get away with it. Whether they actually take the territory, I think, as I said before, I, I think they'll, they'll do it by uh, some circuitous route rather than by direct force. I'm not sure that they, you could say they would back down because they will achieve what they want indirectly. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but my, my feeling is that we are living in a time when Europe is becoming destabilized. Russia is doing it for its own purposes. This is very troubling. And one of the reasons it troubles me, I'll tell you, is that do they really need to do this? Does Putin need to do this to retain power? No. Does Putin need to, you know, expand his borders? No, not really. Nobody is really challenging his borders. NATO is not being aggressive on the on the border, um, and and so why is he doing this when he doesn't have to? This is the same thing with Xi Jinping. Why is he going after Taiwan? Is it really critical? Why did he do in Hong Kong what he did? Is that really critical? And um, in in Xinjiang, you know, where the Uyghurs are, does he have to push them around like this? Probably not. He's being more, you know, dictatorial as we go forward. And maybe that's part of what Winston said. Um, you know, we live in a world where autocracy is emerging and power corrupts absolutely. And these guys see their mission, these autocrats see their mission as doing these bold, aggressive things, not for the rational benefit of it, but just to expand their own personal power. And that might be, in fact, in my opinion, it is one of Putin's major uh, drivers here. It's not because he needs to do this. Okay, thank you, Jay. Uh, Winston, you, we've, we've heard President Biden uh, basically say there'll be grave consequences of sanctions and economic uh, deterrence levied upon Russia should they invade Ukraine. Uh, I guess for negotiation purposes, it's best to keep that uh, generic. 
and not uh, lined out specifically. One specific uh, thing I heard was that uh, Russia would be prohibited from the SWIFT system, which is to say all international wires for banking um, requires a SWIFT number and a SWIFT authorization and that Russia would be prohibited. Therefore, all, all Russian rubles would be contained within Russia. And uh, they really couldn't inter interact with the, the rest of the international community. Uh, what other, could you imagine what other kind of uh, economic sanctions we can levy about uh, Russia and prevent them from you invading Ukraine? So who knows what they've really got on the table there? I mean, they, they, it might be just that everybody involved in the government at certain level and their family members are uh, not allowed to be given uh, the permission to travel to the West or to places where they want to go shopping. I mean, honestly, so they're just going to have to shop at, uh, you know, the luxury stores in Moscow and be content with that. Uh, they, order it, it in by Amazon. Or Amazon, yeah, cutting them off from Amazon.ru. Uh, Jeff Bezos won't like that. Yeah, it, it, it might be uh, you know, other types of sanctions like that. Um, it, cutting them out of the international banking system, that's, that's you know, they'll, they'll find another way to get around that. But I think whatever it is that they have cooking, the Russians know what it is. We know, or our leaders know what it is, but... I think the point of Anthony Blinken saying it will be much more devastating, much more severe than anything that was ever proposed before is just it, it we're not we haven't heard words like this out of the administration for the last year. And now, uh, you know, Joe Biden's come up and he's kind of yesterday was kind of a, a moment for him or that this week where he's kind of you know, rearing up and and putting out his head, whether it's for, uh, you know, the filibuster and putting through voting rights and uh, equating people uh, who, as he was giving the speeches at the black colleges yesterday, uh, do you want to be remembered as a politician as uh, Jefferson Davis or as Abraham Lincoln? And you're sort of making this this equivalency of uh, which is, you know, I think, a, well, obviously different circumstances, but that idea that do you want to be on the right side of history when it comes right down to it. Uh, you know, we have to also remember that NATO was almost given a, a death blow five years ago when you had the, the former president of the United States saying he questions it, it's, its very existence. Why, do, why should we be in that? I don't know that we should. Maybe we should pull out all of our troops and, or whatever, whatever the, the, um, that, that, that solid alliance was was shaken to its fundamental core to the point where the the Germans and the French really had to say, we're on our own here and we need to chart yeah. our own. Well, I, I remember <laughs> that discussion distinctly, and I remember that a lot of it was popular, and that was it's time for the NATO nations to pay their bill. And a lot of people said, yeah, it's about time, and we like Trump for that, and good for him. And um, well, he so, politicized it, Tim. Yes, he did. Yeah, of course he did. And, and we have a question. I don't know if you noticed. We have yeah, a question. Yeah, I, I see. It. I'm gonna. I was gonna ask that to Winston straightforward. Yeah. But the, the we have to remember though that that paying the bill is a different thing than dissolving the alliance. And when you that forced and Angela Merkel to to say, you know, we have to have a different arrangement in Europe. So the Europeans may be looking at this very differently, and I think that they are because they have no great desire to be involved in any conflict or, or pawns in conflict with Russia. They're, they're, they're dependent on them for their, uh, for their fuel supplies. Now, of course, you, the, I think they're working as fast as they can to be, uh, you know, renew, renewables and whatever else they can do to get away from that. But fundamentally, there's a giant Nord 2 pipeline coming in through the Baltic that's, you know, been tacitly approved by this administration. Who knows what will happen with things like that. But the Europeans have to be looking at this from a different perspective than, than a newly reinvigorated or you know a juiced up American supported NATO might be. Um, but hopefully they will present a united front on this, realizing that yeah, this could this could spill over into something much larger. Yeah, as well, all wars happened. spill over into something that was unintended. That's exactly. the nature of war. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Winston. Um, Jay, we, you're right. We, we do have a second question. And before we go to it, I just want to uh, thank Miss um, Zimmerman for the very first question. So the second question is from um, Tom Yamashika. And the question is this. Could you speak to the criticism that used to be levied against the U.S. for being self-appointed policemen of the world? 
Is it worth it for the United States to expend troops, lose lives, etc., to police the Ukrainian and or Chinese situations? Well, I mean, that raises the politicization I'm talking about. Um, you know, Trump not only uh, attacked uh, uh, the uh, NATO to East Western Europe uh, on the basis that they haven't paid their bills. It was, it was more than that. Um, he was he was telling his base, we don't want to support them. We, we don't want to you know, be part of them. Uh, and, and, and thus, and thus uh, politicizing the whole issue. So there were a lot of people asking what Tom Yamachik is asking. Why should we do that? Why should we put America? Didn't we just get out of Afghanistan? Uh, haven't we sworn to avoid putting American boots on the ground, American lives, and spending all that money? We spent tons of money, trillions in Afghanistan. Why, why do we want to do that now? And, and this is a political feeling. If you went through the base right now, the base would say, no way. Okay. And the base and the, G, the GOP saying, no way means that Congress, even if it, it might otherwise take action, I mean, I firmly believe Congress is not going to act on anything, um, not until the elections are done and the GOP wins, then the GOP will do it at once. Um, but, but for now, I don't think, you know, he can, Biden can count on Congress for any of that. So it's a paper tiger. Yeah. You know, the answer to Tom, Tom Yamachika's question is the, the American people, or at least the ones who control things, that is the GOP, they effectively control it by, I call it a legislative veto. You think Joe Manchin's going to back up an adventure in Europe? No way. And that means nobody will. Uh, so my, my feeling is um, that when Biden goes and Tony Blinken, they, they say they're going to do draconian things to Russia. Huh, really? Really? When's the last time you did that? Um, and so I think they know, the Russians know, Putin knows that it's paper tiger talking. It will not happen. I think- the Well, then, then, then what's, this, what's to prevent him from going in? If, if you really believe that Biden's talk is paper tiger talk, what, what, what disincentive does Putin have uh, to stay out of Ukraine versus going in? Optics, optics. What does Putin care about optics? What, what, what optics? He, well, he wants to be seen as a, a global leader. Uh, he wants to be respected, held in awe, but not necessarily in you know, fear of war, although we might have that fear, um, by Europe. Uh, he has a long plan that'll get him, as I said before, that'll get him to where he wants to go without firing a shot. Isn't that better? I mean, he's got a He's got to deal with people in Russia, too, who don't want to put boots on the ground. Um, so he's not going to go in. He can get there indirectly. It's like what he's done to the U.S., what he's doing to the U.S. in the election. You know, he's got the Internet Research Agency working night and day to try to divide us and make bubbles and, you know, and, and fragment the American public. Um, and fragment our government. And he has, assuming he's largely responsible uh, directly or indirectly for all of this trouble we have in terms of fragmented public opinion. Um, he's done a pretty good job without firing a shot and without admitting that he did anything. You know, you can't be sure that he did it. So you know, the, the, the problem there is uh, that, you know, um, he's done a very good job at that without firing a shot, without seeing, seeming to be bellicose. In this case, I think you, you, have, to, you have to see his strategy uh, in other areas, and then and you can figure out, you can connect the dots on what he's doing here. So, A, he's not going to go in, I agree. Um, and B, we're not going to go in either. This yeah. is all, it's all a chess game. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jay, for your comments. Uh, Winston, President Biden already proactively uh, stated that the United States has no in intention of uh, responding to this conflict with military um, aid in, in any, well, at least as far as boots on the ground. Um, that may change as far as military equipment and assistance to Ukraine. Hard to say how that pans out or not pans out. How's Joe Biden doing specifically to this crisis. Uh, Jay says the United States is acting like a paper tiger. Do you agree with that? Or has Joe Biden provided a, a, a tone that has Putin's attention and um, his concern? Maybe both. Uh, it, what are we, are we really gonna go and, and defend Ukraine? in some meaningful fashion and provide boots on the ground it's not going to happen no he no biden said he won't put boots on the ground he was, that was definitive comment 
it, it's it's not a it, it's not a member of NATO. Uh, it is a it is a buffer state. I mean, maybe what will come out of this? Let's be optimistically naive and say that Ukraine becomes some sort of uh, neutral state like uh, like Austria after the allies pulled out of it after the war and it be or, or perhaps something like a, a Sweden or Finland, a, a buffer in effect. So this is and, and within this zone, remember, uh, there's always a, we pulled out of that that uh, the nuclear forces, um, intermediate nuclear forces. Those could always be reintroduced. There's those types of threats as well. At the end of the day, you know, Putin sells a lot of military equipment to third world uh, countries and second world, first world countries. I mean, the, the, the Turks are buying their equipment. So for them to stand up to the world's great power, the United States and, and its allies and says, hey, we can do this. And they're, they back down. So why don't you buy some of our whatever military equipment that we're selling? He stands to win in this. He might face some sanctions temporarily, but he's going to go back home with a win. He's, let's face it, you don't want to be living in Russia. Uh, the COVID is running rampant. Their, their life expectancy is shrinking uh, every single year. They've got a lot of issues at home. This is a good distraction for him. Uh, he's a bully, so he gets to satisfy that part of the ego. But at the end of the day, maybe we'll come out with something that results in, it, hopefully, a little bit more pulling back from the edge. Uh, I, I hope that's what happens. We'll know in a week or two uh, what will happen, but maybe it could be something where there's some face saving and you know, the shenanigans are going to continue. Let's not be that naive. It's still going to be poking in at Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania and, and flying over NATO territories and uh, everything that they can do, destabilizing our own nation, our own elections, as Jay was saying. That's not going away. But if we can avoid something right now, um, I'd say more power to them. Yeah. You know, you use the term face saving, and that's an important term because whenever you get into a conflict that doesn't look like it'd be resolved, saving face seems to be paramount for, for our leaders uh, of every nation, not just uh, Russia here. Um, but there was a 1990 conventional armed forces um, European agreement, and that agreement didn't just pertain to nuclear weapons, but certainly conventional arms. And uh, there's there's comments whether or not that could be dusted off and that treaty be uh, used as the basis to unwind this particular conflict, thereby allowing Putin to save face and all other parties to save face. Uh, you think that's a possibility? You know, remember, he got kicked out of the G8 when he invaded uh, Crimea. Uh, he's still in power. He's still selling gas to the Europeans. Uh, the, the, it's not a lot has happened since then. Maybe the route with Russia, although Europe and Russia have always kind of wanted to treat each other as cousins at arm's length a little bit. But they, you know, let's face it, Victoria's kids married into the Tsar's family. They all had their blood disease. Uh, maybe maybe this is a, a route where Putin says, you know what, my basic geopolitical interests for this nation long term lie in tying us firmly into Europe so that we don't have to face that threat on the western part of our border because our underbelly is completely exposed and who knows about the Far East. So maybe in the long run, he's playing a longer game here that uses this as a platform for, um, for neutralizing that and becoming maybe a, I don't know, look down the road 10 years and say, we're partners rather than adversaries or potential adversaries. Let's hope for that. I mean, that would be the best outcome for him so that he can face all the other threats that he's got at home. All righty. Hey, we're out of time. Uh, Jay, your final comments on this topic? Yeah, what about climate change? You know, the, the whole planet, humanity is suffering under climate change and COVID. And, and here we are uh, screwing around on the border of Ukraine. Um, it's the wrong direction, and, and he's not being altruistic. The other thing I want to mention is I think it's, there's a connection here between the paper tiger problem, uh, where you know, we didn't get the, uh, the better, Build Back Better bill through, and uh, you know, Biden has all but given up on that. And um, you know, he's, making, he's stamping his feet about um, voting, uh, suggesting that we have to you know, change the filibuster on that. But you know, that's not going to happen either. 
and and his inability to get his initiatives through in this country affect his clout overseas, right? If you're Putin, you are looking at how effective Biden is in the U.S., and you're seeing how powerful a president he is. And I'm afraid that he's losing these initiatives. He doesn't look too powerful. Um, at the same time, um, you know, uh, I think Putin knows how to play the game and look powerful, um, look strong, even if he isn't. So <clears throat> it's too bad we're in this place because because as uh, the guns of August by um, uh, Barbara, mm, um, the guns of August, great book back in the uh, back mm, 20 years ago, uh, evaluating the start of World War One. Um, it, it was just like this. And, 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 and if, if you looked uh, back at World War II, the things that happened in the 30s were a pretty good signal of what was, uh, what was gonna happen. Um, and I think um, uh, mistakes are made, even if Putin does not intend to have war and Biden certainly doesn't want war and the base in this country don't want war and the people in Western Europe don't want war, it could happen anyway. By the way, it's Barbara Tuckman, The Guns of August. And it is haunting now because all these things that are programmed for violence, for war, um, just as they were before World War I and II. Great comments. Thank you, Jay. Winston, you get the last word and the last comment. Not going to happen, Jay. We're not going to war. I don't think it's going it, to, the shenanigans will continue. No one has a any interest in making this a hotter conflict than it already is. My hopes are for uh, de-escalation at this point. Putin goes home, declares his victories, uh, gets whatever accolades he needs. Europe becomes a little bit, gets a breathing room so that maybe they can come with, with some better options like they have in the past. And we can pull back from this brink. I want to be optimistic, not naively so, but uh, I would like to err on the side that we can come out of this a little bit better. And as far as Biden goes, poor man, he's just hanging on my thread in the Senate. He doesn't have a lot of room to maneuver here, regardless whether it's domestic or support for any policies that he's got. So whatever that, uh, that uh, he can get accomplished, more power to him as well. You know, you know, right. Tim, uh, the word endemic uh, does suggest itself. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, as far as COVID is concerned, we're going to have a long-term model. It'll be endemic. It won't threaten human race so much, but it'll be, you know, insinuated throughout. And the same thing with this country. Um, you know, we will lose the democracy that we've had, um, and we'll have some other dystopian form of it. And it will settle down to some kind of endemic situation in terms of the political arrangement in this country. And I suggest from Winston's comments that what is going to happen in Europe is that Biden, or rather Putin, um, will find a way to be more influential economically and, and, and politically uh, throughout Europe. And it'll settle down into a new system uh, where Russia has more influence. It'll be endemic in that, too. Yes. OK. All righty. Well, we run out of time. I want to thank both my guests, Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, for their wise and insightful comments. Please join us next week, Wednesday at 11 o'clock for What Now America. I'm Tim Apatel, your host, and I hope to see you then. Aloha. <laughs>